Hello, we are in one of my favorite Prague cafes in a place that is really cool and gorgeous and part of a really amazing house that was built in the early 20th century and I'm sure you know it from looking at it from the outside. We're going to show it to you in more detail today as is our custom in this series and we're going to take you with the camera to places you don't normally get to. Prague on Seletna Street and we've come to see one of my favorite houses ever and I think I'm not alone in liking it a lot. I think the architect of this house, Josef Gokar, has managed to do something really special. 110 years after it was built, the house now functions as a first-class tourist attraction and if you stand here for a while you will see hordes of people looking at it, taking pictures and discussing it. Something that houses from this period really only rarely manage to do. This house is an icon of the Prague UNESCO area and of modern architecture because it belongs to a movement we know as Cubism, which is something that appeared in painting in the early 20th century, but it only made its way into architecture in this significant way here in Czechia. Thanks to the architects Pavel Janak, Josef Gokar, Josef Chochol, or Emil Kralicek, they sought to actually bring this analytical way of looking at things, this cubism, into architecture. Yes, of course, it mostly remained only on the facade and in the decor of some specific elements. It didn't show up so much in the spatial conception, especially in this house, but it still attracts attention to this day. to be two historic houses on this site. They were demolished, replaced by one mixed-use shop house, and its form kind of suggests that. In the main facade, the house is broken, and it actually shows that there were originally two things here, not just one. The statue of the iconic Black Madonna, the Black Mother of God, was taken down from that one, and it's back on the facade again, and it gave the name to this new building. Details aside, the house is actually projected in a very traditional way. It has a beautiful ground floor with large wooden portals and big storefronts. That's what you register when you move around the neighborhood. Then there's the body of the building. With the huge windows, the so-called bay windows curved to the side, and if you look at them up close, you'll see that the windows are quite large. So there's very little mass and a lot of windows. Then the next floor comes in and that looks a little bit different. Those windows are no longer curved, they're slightly articulated, they're sort of channeled mullions between them, lower clearance and suddenly it gets a whole different detail. Then there's a large cornice, a traditional thick heavy cornice, even much larger than the adjacent buildings. So it's not like some attempt at historicism, but it's actually emphasizing the, the same height, which connects it beautifully to the surrounding houses. And then the mansard roof originally with apartments, actually still quite a tall mass. When you're in front of the house, you can't quite see it. But if you move away to a greater distance, you suddenly notice that the mass is really big and actually overhangs the neighboring houses. And it says this is a new regulation and as time goes on, maybe those other houses will be taller too and they can connect to that house. And I think in a nice way, the advertising signage is remembered as well. So clearly the exact locations where those things are going to appear are set out. It's not like the architect didn't think about it and thought, well, then somebody comes along and does it. An important part of the building is the deliberately monumentalized entrance, which is done in such a way that you don't really get confused and you don't have to look for it. But nowadays it's hidden behind a whole range of information that you're supposed to know more about. It's inside and I think that's a shame. 
I understand the reasons behind it, but not putting these things here would do the house a great service. I've mentioned several times on our show that the staircase, the stairwell, that it's quite an opportunity to create some memorable space, something amazing that in the rest of that house, it's often quite laced and you have some freedom here, so you can clearly see that here. Something fantastic has been done here, I think. Anybody who comes in here and lifts their head up, they're not going to forget this staircase. It's actually a simple horseshoe-shaped, bulb-shaped form without a single landing, quite a steep thing with a wonderful handrail. And because of that skylight from the top, it's a really great experience. Grand Café Orient, which is a café that was built in this place in 1912. A Cubist café with beautiful furniture, fantastic lights, also an amazing space, elevated with reinforced concrete girders, so there's not a single column with an amazing balcony to look out onto this historic part of the city. But it's quite interesting that this space operated like this for maybe 10, 12 years and then the interior was destroyed because it was deemed unfashionable. It was rebranded for other uses and it wasn't until 2005 that the current tenant, Mr. Rudolf Brinek, decided to restore this thing. Based on the surviving photographs of the original interior, this place has been recreated with replica furniture and a whole host of beautiful details, and I would like to thank him for that. It makes me absolutely happy whenever I come here, and it's amazing that this kind of thing exists. You can come here, you can visit, and you can experience the atmosphere. I remember when I first came in here as a boy, I found it fascinating. Obviously, there are a lot of little beautiful details here that will get your attention. If you ignore them for a moment and look at the basic spatial decisions, they look like this. We're in a space that, with the exception of the stairwell, covers the entire floor plan of this building. So, from the outside, you might think the house is relatively small, but when you step inside, you suddenly realize it's not that small. There's a couple of key decisions like that, I think. One is, interior wall is dark. It's clad in dark wood so that really where there's the least amount of light, there's even less. And then if you go to the exterior facade, on the other hand, that contains huge windows. And they're so-called bay windows, meaning they're not straight. They have beveled edges that you can see out a little bit better. And it's a different kind of experience. And those windows really let in a tremendous amount of light. So all of a sudden, you've got this range from the darkest to the brightest. The big space is even more elevated, so... There are really no columns inside. They're hidden in the facade and then in the supporting core. So we're looking at a very large space that has no internal support. It's reinforced with concrete strips, which we see in the ceiling very advanced technology for the time. It's winter, so this place is empty, but when the weather is a little bit warmer, this is my favorite place. Actually a balcony that follows the entire side of this building and you can really sit on them and become part of the city. And I'm happy that it's not some little thing, but that there's a good chunk of space dedicated to it. The designer of this building is Joseph Gokar, and that's arguably the most important architect who worked in Czechia in the 20th century. Whenever there is a poll on this subject, I think Joseph Gokar wins. And there are several reasons for that. Obviously, the stuff is fantastic, but he managed to work in all of architecture styles from the beginning of the 20th century to the beginning of World War II in his career. 
So he captured Art Nouveau, Cubism, Rondo Cubism, Modernism, Functionalism. All of these things are found in his work. And the fascinating thing is that they're all great. What usually happens is that someone concentrates on something, masters it, perfects it, and develops it throughout their life. Maybe some best architects, they try something else. But the fact that someone would continuously follow the whole development as architecture evolved until the 20th century is quite exceptional. We're currently in the Black Madonna restaurant, which is the place that you see from the street when you're near this house. But when you go inside, you'll find that it goes underground into the former wine shop. So you can visit that like this. It's a place that opened relatively recently, and its interior contains a number of elements that refer back to the creation of this house in 1912. currently on one of the two floors dedicated to the Cubism exhibition under the auspices of the Museum of Arts and Industry. I think it's a beautiful opportunity where you can see individual works of art, individual elements of furniture, design in a space that is actually the same as below. So you can compare design and architecture in one environment. It's a perfect thing. first loft which serves as an exhibition hall and I'm pleased to see that the principles are very similar to what we've seen below us so the construction again reinforced concrete girders that are trapped in the load-bearing wall and therefore without additional necessary support I think it's quite unusual for an attic The top floor at the very top of the attic is dedicated to storage space, but again you can see the construction here. And it's really unique, it's actually a little bit different on each floor and it follows that exterior form, but that desire to keep as much open space as possible that permeates the whole house. This whole building went through quite a dramatic evolution in the 20th century, but in the early 1990s, it was reconstructed by Carol Prager's team, who you know well from our show, and I think he's stepped in in a pretty big way. He's actually cleaned up a whole bunch of different additions, extensions, partitions, and he's done a lot of restoration. And as we're standing up here under the roof, we can see the structure and the glass glazing, but Carol Prager wasn't very happy with that because I think the contractor here was the one that was responsible for changing his design. So this kind of thing was common in the 90s and it looks very strange here today. This house we showed you today for several reasons but the main one for me is that I don't know many other similar buildings that manage to enter the historical environment in a striking contemporary way but at the same time to be able to build on it in a way that that I don't think it ever caused any major conflict and to this day I think this house is still appreciated by pretty much everybody so it is possible to enter the historical environment with something different, something new, something innovative without damaging and developing it. We have an example for that. It is just clear that it is not easy to imitate it.